Hello and welcome to a special Zelda edition of, I almost said Tears of the Kingdom, of uh, <laughs> Starside Chat. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Aaron. With me as always is Zach. How's it going, Zach? Good. Welcome to our All Zelda All the Time podcast that we're doing. We are briefly <laughs> going to touch on, there's been a lot of news as well, but most we've pretty much been playing Zelda nonstop since we picked it up last week. Yeah. So we'll I'm... talk about that as well. I've played a bunch this last week, so yeah, we're going to definitely dive deep into it and talk a lot about our experiences and what we like and all of that stuff. Before the meat of the episode, though, we should talk... There has been a lot of news that has happened in the last week. Yes. So first off, Microsoft's Activision Blizzard acquisition kind of took a a step forward after a lot of like bad news recently. Uh, the European Commission approved the acquisition. That's just like one step in the process. It's not like, okay, done deal now, but mm-hmm. it's positive momentum for for that actually happening, uh, which I do hope that it does happen uh, for Xbox sake, but also it would just be cool to have, I don't know, Activision Blizzard games on you know console. Like a lot of mm. like World of Warcraft, for instance, if that came to console, that would be, that would crazy. be, it would be a cool thing to see. So, yeah. uh, and also like we like Xbox, even though we're not like huge on Xbox these days, but like their market share has got to be significantly lower than Sony yeah. and Nintendo. So just like them having sort of this big leg up in the game would be helpful. You would think, even if it's like, a little bit industry consolidation it's also a little bit like comp- more competition between the big three so well and i've heard i mean people are pretty down on blizzard these days and so yeah a lot of people are like <laughs> give blizzard to microsoft so they can start managing it better um yeah well it's not really happening you say that but there was a, a the whole thing with redfall true that's a really um, good point so it's hard to uh, say i i mean i have to figure it's better than uh <laughs> you know blizzard's current situation but let's uh, talk spe- about speaking uh, of which they canceled yeah. <laughs> overwatch 2's pve mode which is what everybody was waiting for for that that so. was basically the reason to have an overwatch 2 exactly in my I, understanding the the updates as far as the pvp stuff goes is pretty minimal uh and could have just happened with overwatch 1 like yeah. so yeah the reason for being for overwatch 2 basically is non-existent now which is insane to me i can't believe they they canceled it it's it was it's a pretty massive crazy. bummer so, for me the article i read about it was talking about how because overwatch 2 or overwatch famously started out as project titan which was going to be like pve uh focused and then they couldn't get it to work so they were just like, let's make this PvP. We'll use the same assets and it'll just, it'll work like that. And then seemingly again, they were like, no, let's try to go, let's try to go PvE again. And it failed again. So twice now they've tried to make this IP go like PvE and they've just like, for whatever reason in the background, they've decided it's not working and they just need to revert back to a mostly PvP arena. Yeah, I mean, they have some PvE stuff for different events or whatever, but it's not, like, the full-on PvE stuff that people wanted, so. Uh, yeah, It's I was weird. How do you feel that. about this? I, I'm pretty checked out on Overwatch. I probably haven't played it in a, a couple of years. I dive back in every now and then during, like, different events or whatever, and there are, like, little touches for Overwatch 2 that you're like, why did they change this? Like, the... <laughs> The end screen, for instance, at the end of like a match, it used to be like, hey, vote for your favorite teammate or member of the other team that you think is like the MVP or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was like just a fun thing to get like some accolades from like your the other people you played with in the match. And that's just like gone now for no reason. <laughs> it's just like, why would you change that? Why would you remove it? It's just like little things like that that make no sense. As far and I haven't been in the game for a while, so I don't know if they re-added that or not. But like, it's just like small stuff like that. Like, why would that have gone away? It's a little like when Destiny Two came out. You're like, you mm. solved all these things with Destiny yeah. One. You had all of this stuff going for it, and then you brought out Destiny Two, and now it's like, well, hey, where's all the stuff? <laughs> yeah, not <laughs> great. So, I don't know why they did any of that, but 
Um, next week, there will be a PlayStation showcase. They didn't really say anything too specific about this, but look forward is, to... So, Keeley said um, he like tweeted about it, and I couldn't tell from his tweet. I think his tweet was intentionally ambiguous as to whether or not this was technically part of Summer Games Fest. Um, Because he says, like, here is this event to kick off Summer Games Fest season. So, like, is he involved or is he just saying, like, hey, this is the time of year? (laughs) That is weird. That almost sounds like he's, like, I don't know, insert himself into the conversation. But I mean, it is. I mean, this time of year has now become his thing because he's got Summer Games Fest. Especially with the death of E3. Exactly. So... I don't know. I don't think it's technically part of Summer Games Fest, but I will th- I will say I think this is like the beginning of fake E3, which is exciting. And Sony is getting ahead of everybody and deciding they're going to do their first thing as, instead of waiting for like, I think everything else is happening in the first week of June or the second week of June. I forget mm-hmm. when that opening night is, but um, they were like, no, well, last week of May, we're dropping down our showcase and here it is. So... <laughs> Yeah, and this week, I think after this like PlayStation showcase uh, was announced, there was like uh, one of the hashtags trending on Twitter was like Ghost of Tsushima 2. So everybody's like mm. maybe anticipating we'll get like a Ghost of Tsushima 2 announcement. Yeah. We know they're going to have Spider-Man this fall. Right. And they're working on a, uh, a Wolverine game. So maybe we'll find out more about that stuff. But Oh, I forgot about that Wolverine game. Yeah, so I mean... Maybe I'm keeping my fingers crossed for Ghost of Tsushima 2 because I'm I loved the the first one. So. Is there something so I'm trying to think if there's anything that is on the horizon that I would just be like really into seeing gameplay of. I think actually the biggest thing for me, I think, is if they were to show more of that se- the sequel to uh, Final Fantasy 7 remaster. Uh, yeah, or remake. Yeah. yeah. And that was, is like tentatively expected maybe late this year or yeah. probably put being pushed back to next year. So yeah, that would be another one to look out for. I forget what the naming scheme is because they're all re-something. Yeah, it's I think re- the second one is maybe Rebirth. Oh yeah, I think that's right. But that would be really cool to see. Um, I'm trying to think of other IP. Wouldn't it be crazy if they were like, here's another Uncharted game? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen because they're oh, all, you know, they're we all might, in on left. Uh, we might get more right. footage of that Last of Us weird PVE. Yeah, that's what I was PvP just going to say. Thing. They might they might show some of that if they've got it. But yeah, there is like a TV show for that Twisted Metal uh, series. Yes. What if they do drop like a trailer for like a new Twisted Metal game? I could see that. Yeah, I uh, one of the people in that show is someone I listen to on a podcast. And so... I've been hearing a lot about that show coming up. So, oh yeah, that would be a great integration, I think. It would make sense. So maybe. But uh, speaking of things coming up, Amazon is reportedly working on a Lord of the Rings MMO developed by the team that made New World. So like in that engine. Uh, and I liked what I played of New World. I know that's like it's still a, an ongoing thing. I uh, like when I get into a new game, I will very often like follow the subreddit. And mm. sometimes, like in the case of New World, I will forget to unsubscribe <laughs> from the subreddit. Yeah. And so every now and then I'll, I'll see like, oh, hey, there are just people talking about it or whatever. And they were talking about this and people were uh, questioning whether the team was like big enough to be devoted to two different MMOs at the same time. But mm. um I don't know. I, I, again, I liked what I played of New World, even though I didn't stick with it long term. But um, I'm curious to see what they do with the Lord of the Rings MMO. Also, uh, a little bit curious to see if it's more like geared towards their awful Rings of Power series or if it's a little bit more like Tolkien based. Yeah, you I know? wonder <laughs> what time period it's going to take place in. Who can say? I don't know. It, knowing Amazon and the fact that Rings of Power is their like thing, it probably will be more geared around that, which is a little bit of a bummer. But what can you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, another announcement that came out this last week is the Expanse, the, the Telltale series. Like episode one is supposed to launch in July, July twenty seventh. 
and then they're supposed to have new episodes every two weeks. Uh, I think, I, I don't know, I haven't played a Telltale series since, like, the first Walking Dead series. Oh, wow. Um, but I do love The Expanse, so I'm, I am a little bit curious about this. You think you are going to try this out? Maybe. Um, I don't know. Like you, I have not played a Telltale game. Actually, I don't know that I've ever played one before. For whatever reason, those types of games have never captured my imagination. Um, But I love The Expanse, so that might be enough to get me to check it out. It's an interesting sort of twist on the point-and-click adventure type of a thing, but... um. Yeah, they, they've just not really been something I've cared too much about, especially since it's like episodic and you have to kind of yeah. wait for new episodes and everything. I don't love that format for games, even though it's like how TV works. But um, another big announcement from this last week's, uh, I guess I, this might even be two weeks old, but Starfield's ESRB rating leaked and there it showed uh in game purchases which everybody was uh very afraid of because it could yeah. mean microtransactions or it could just be the creation club stuff which it was like the console based mods uh which were in previous uh Bethesda games like Fallout and I don't know if they ever made it to Skyrim or not but um so I mean it could be that but it could also be microtransactions which is not cool but I'm so curious. I mean, right now we have a definitive date. We don't have to stop guessing anymore. Like right after the Microsoft press conference, immediately after it, there's going to be a Starfield like long play or whatever, where they're going to go in depth about it. We're going to learn way more about it. So maybe we'll learn about like in-game purchasable things during this. I don't know. Or maybe they'll yeah, just keep maybe it quiet we'll learn what that means. But I, after sort of the failure of Redfall, everybody was like, oh, every, everything hinges on Starfield yeah. for Microsoft. A lot and to prove. It made a lot of people a little wary of Starfield or more wary than maybe they had been in the past. And it's a little like, I don't think that's warranted because they're different development teams. So like one game failing isn't like, oh, this means Starfield's in trouble. Like yeah. that doesn't mean that. But also it is Bethesda. <laughs> and you just never know you but never know we have to talk about silk song we do need to talk about silk song <laughs> so the week that zelda came out there was also some silk song news frustratingly the thing about silk song is that the team lives in australia and are constantly radio silent and so you don't get a lot of people knocking on their door being like hey can we you know learn about this in the process but they have decided they their community manager put out a statement on Twitter. And this is the first thing we've heard about Silk Song in a long time. But basically he was like, hey, we were targeting the first half of 2023. That's no longer going to happen anymore. The game needs time because the game is getting really big and we're really excited about it. It's really shaping up to be great, but we're no longer targeting the first half of this year. And... That's totally fine. I think that Microsoft really, like, they threw their weight behind them and they were like, hey, let us put you in our montage. Like, we're our whole deal at this fake E3 is, uh, like, everything that we're showing is going to come out in a year. So just, like, you know, commit to coming out in a year and we'll throw a bunch of money at you and you'll get your game pass and whatnot. So it's going to be great for you. And they were probably like, sure, um, we'll try. But again, they're like so radio silent. I wish they would at least put like little trailers up. I started following the people that make uh, that Crow Sworn game. Oh, yeah. That is also in development. Is that what it's called? Crow Sworn? Yeah, yeah. They are pretty active on Twitter uh, and they'll post like little gameplay clips of them testing stuff out of it, which is great. And I wish Silk Song would do that. But uh, Team Cherry is famously tight lipped. So I don't think this is a bad thing. In fact, them saying that the game is getting really big, I think is a good thing because if, you know, if Hollow Knight had been twice as long, I would be twice as happy. So (laughs) uh, the quality of it, I think is just going to be insane. Uh, Like the polish on it, I think is going to like blow everybody away. And I'm... I I hope so because famously I could not play Hollow Knight on PC because... That's true. Yeah, it was bugged out on your, uh, your Steam Deck. Yeah. I think it's going to be great. I don't know that it's going to come out in 2024 or 2023. I mean, um, they said uh, 
they didn't say it's not we're not targeting this year they said they're not targeting the first half of this year so i don't know i i don't think we'll see anything about it in this fake e3 we maybe we'll see like a little trailer but i don't think we're going to get a release date and i don't think it's going to show up at the microsoft press conference well um, here, would, here would be a, a complete curveball what if next week during that Sony PlayStation Showcase Silk Song just shows up. <laughs> that would be insane, and that would be <laughs> a crazy twist. Yeah, um, but I would be all about it. It's crazy because, like, at this point, all the major three have all shown a trailer for Silk Song. Like, Nintendo was the first people to do it way back when, and then Sony had one at theirs, and Microsoft started their press conference last year, I think, with a Silk Song trailer. So it's like, it's a hot commodity. People know that people like want this to come out and they want to play it on their console. So Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's coming out on everything. So I mean, it's not like they're tied to any particular platform. It's true. Even though it's a Game Pass game, they're not like, there's no sort of exclusivity happening. I thought there was going to be exclusivity maybe with uh, the Switch, but that's not the case. Um, So I don't know, man, like they know that it's, it's going to be super hot commodity when it comes out. So I am a little bit, I don't know, part of me is like, man, I really hope it doesn't come out this year because I don't know what's going to be my game of the year if Tears of the Kingdom and this come out in the same year. <laughs> but at the same time, I do really want to play it. So I hope it's maybe the second half of 2023. Well, uh, to kind of go back a little bit to like Xbox related things, did you see this or hear about this Phil Spencer yeah. uh, interview with... Uh, kind of funny where he talked about or he sort of apologized for Redfall and uh, in that interview that he kind of was like taking responsibility I guess for the failure of Redfall and talking about how uh, Xbox sort of lost you know the the last generation uh, in terms of like console war stuff and uh, a lot of people were like, yeah, they're never going to win the console war. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially not if they don't complete this, you know, Activision Blizzard purchase. But, like, uh, he called last console generation the most important console generation. It was probably the biggest misstep in video game history, maybe. that When they came out with that Xbox One, which, number one, started out with, like, you always have to be online. They had all this terrible press of people it, being like, well, if you don't want to be online, like... Xbox 360 has great games. Go back to that. <laughs> yeah. Also, it was, was like horrible. bundled with a Connect for a long time, and it, they were like, yeah, you, "You gotta ha- buy you the could Connect." Not get it without the Connect, and so it made it an extra hundred dollars more expensive. Right after their awful press conference, there was that like little thirty second video of like the president of Sony and another person being like, "This is how you share games on uh, PlayStation," and they and just like just hand- handed a game. Over. Yeah. <laughs> just terrible press, like awful uh yeah. nobody was on their side except for like hardcore xbox gamers and in, i think he's right that's that was why what we the switched part. it's true <laughs> it's the it was i think a very important console generation because people did start to collect their digital libraries and it's hard to just say i have all this stuff on playstation oh i should get an xbox and start to rebuild my library yeah. like he's right people locked I in mean, at that generation to an extent some of that was happening on the 360 ps3 generation because i still true. have digital games for from the xbox 360 generation but yeah Yeah. and well between that and like playstation plus or xbox live where they're like every month they give you new titles to add Mm -hmm. to your library that you can only play while you're still subscribed to that service so you're you're building up uh even games you didn't necessarily buy but they're that's how they sort of lock you into their platform and so he he famously said building great games isn't going to get people to like sell their ps5 and pick up an yeah. xbox and I, I think to an extent a little bit that's true but also like one of the reasons like aside from the fact that they really botched the messaging around the launch of the xbox one one of the reasons we switched to the ps5 was for their exclusives true so, I think if they were like, hey, we have all these really great exclusives lined up to launch on whatever the next Xbox generation is, like anytime there's a generational leap, that's when you have an opportunity to like, you know, steal some PlayStation players, for instance. And 
So I don't know if I completely agree that just building great games is going to get people to like switch over to Xbox. I think you have an opportunity for that. Um, and obviously building great games is going to keep people on your platform. So And I, Game like, Pass is a great step in the right direction. That's something unique to Xbox where you are getting such a crazy value proposition. Yeah. Well, and right now without the great exclusives, that's really the only thing tying people to Xbox. Yeah. So I don't know. I thought it was interesting. It's an interesting conversation, especially since he was so like candid about like yeah. everything going on with Xbox, which you, I feel like would never see with the like presidents of Sony no. and Nintendo. Absolutely but, not N- Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Nintendo, there will not be a new Nintendo console until April, 2024 at the earliest. Uh, this came out like a week or two ago. What would you predict? Like t- Breath of the Wild famously is maybe the best launch game mm-hmm. of any console launch. You've got to imagine they're like, okay, we need a, like a very stellar launch title or titles, launch lineup for whatever the Switch 2 is. You think it's a Mario? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I, I think ever, now that Tears of the Kingdom is out, everybody is like, oh, for sure, like over the summer, we're going to get some sort of announcement about Super Mario Odyssey 2 or like mm. whatever the next mainline Mario game ends what up What a dream being. that would be. Which would be awesome, but um, it could be Super Mario Odyssey 2 as like a launch title for like yeah. fall 2024 of like a new Nintendo console. I could see that. Uh, which would be very cool, but yeah, other than that, I don't know what they would use since they just burned a new Zelda <laughs> title, yeah. so they don't have that available. Maybe it'll launch with uh, Dragon Age Dreadwolf. Well, a Switch would not launch with Dragon Age Dreadwolf. Uh, but that game also <laughs> uh, will not release before April 2024. So I guess, like, time period-wise, it would work out. But I, I doubt BioWare is targeting the Switch for, <laughs> or whatever the what next... What if that's the twist? <laughs> what if uh, I the guess new it's true. Switch is, like, super, like, jacked in the power? Like, it, it weighs, like, 10 pounds or something. <laughs> I guess it's true. Maybe we have to stop thinking about the Switch as this underpowered thing if they're going to have a new generation of it. Maybe it will be powerful enough to run something like that. But Who can say? Um, yeah, it was weird because Bioware said, I think last October, that like they had reached alpha status, so the game was like actually playable from start to finish, which, you know, if that's true, and they're giving themselves till, you know, at the earliest, like may 2024 or something like that for a launch then um that's a good amount of time to like polish and fix things up so that's good they need much like starfield bioware is in need of a win and so this is gonna have to be good bioware Um, maybe even more so they've had a not great track record the past couple of years what about you think we'll get uh at the sony thing you think we'll get any micros uh mass effect stuff no, because they're all in on Dragon Age at this point. So yeah. until they, I, I feel like this is kind of like Nintendo putting all their chips in on Zelda until yeah. that comes out before they even announce another Mario game. I, I feel like it's kind of the same thing with Bioware. They're they're going to launch in. Dragon Age before they are like, okay, here's stuff about Mass Effect. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to point this out because I thought it was interesting. There's like a a weird little sort of retro, like classic cartoon looking first person shooter that evidently is coming out. Uh, Game Informer had an article about it this last week. And I saw this. It's uh, It seems very early. They're still in like the white box stage uh, testing stuff. Yeah, the the trailers that they've put out for this look like uh, they're like a tech demo, basically. They don't look like an actual game just yet, but especially if you like Cuphead or like... Yeah, this is old... like first person Cuphead. Well, yeah, and black and white too. It's not like full color uh animation but yeah definitely that kind of art style where it's that retro classic cartoon look which for a shooter i thought that was really interesting yeah (laughs) tell me about this 
Ark Raiders thing. Do you remember this game? It made a little bit of a splash a couple years ago. There was a trailer for it, which seemed pretty cool. It was a PvE type thing where the trailers were like you and a bunch of other people were in like very wide open spaces and you were all like kind of racing to kill these giant robots. It looked cool. It had an interesting premise. There were like these spheres that you had to fight. They've come out and they've said, we're mixing this up a little bit. It's no longer just going to be PvE. It's going to be PvPvE. It's now an extraction shooter, similar to uh, like Tarkov or something like that. So they've really changed uh, the gameplay mechanics of it. Uh, but I'm interested in it. it I, I have never gotten into an extraction shooter, but I've always thought that I would enjoy it. I almost got into uh, whatever that space one was. Something Cycle? I don't, the Cycle? Was oh, that something? Oh, the Cycle. Yeah, I remember that game. But I ended up not doing that. But I like the aesthetic of this, of Arc Raiders. It's very cool and kind of retro almost. Uh, and I... I would I would watch someone play this, and if I, I liked what I saw, I would maybe check this out. Yeah, I liked that the look of the the game from that PVE trailer they showed like a year or two ago. But yeah, um, yeah, I can get into PVE VP stuff now and then. I don't know how into like the idea of a Tarkov like I am, but um, I'll be curious to see more about this game when they actually show a little bit more. Maybe we'll see this at uh, Sony's thing. I think yeah. it maybe showed up at a, show, a Sony press conference. I don't remember. It could be. I don't remember either. Uh, and then finally, they have announced Mortal Kombat 1, which is a reboot. I have not. I don't know a lot about the lore of the most recent Mortal Kombat games, but mm-hmm. um, I know that they're like written really like people enjoy the story. People will watch like just uh, compilations of the cutscenes to learn about the lore of the most recent ones and. Yeah. I think the most recent ones culminated in basically Liu Kang becoming a god, basically, and saying, this has not worked out. I'm going to go back to the like the very, very beginning, reset the whole timeline, and hopefully things will turn out differently. And that is, I think, what this is. It is, uh, they're calling it Mortal Kombat 1. It's going to be going back to their very first roots, and uh, just kind of going from there. It's going to be kind of a reset. So people are speculating maybe gameplay-wise, there might be some pretty stark differences, but we're not really sure yet. They have, Who knows what percent of that trailer that they've released is like gameplay. I mean, some of those fatalities might be gameplay, just like cutscenes. But uh, it could be that we haven't seen gameplay yet. And if that's the case, maybe they have like made some pretty crazy changes. But... This is something else that could possibly pop up in the upcoming fake E3 season. Yeah. Yeah. I bet we do see something uh, of this uh, during that. But yeah, I'm not a big fighting game fan. But like you said, the uh, fans of fighting games, this one t- tends to be the one that story wise is like interesting to people uh, to play. Even if they don't get super into like the competitive scene, they'll play it because the story, they like the story. But. I think that uh, they've also announced that. So Johnny Cage is they've li- they've modeled him after uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, which apparently is a reference to him wanting to be Johnny Cage at one point in the past. Uh, it's mm-hmm. also maybe related to they're making a sequel to that HBO Max Mortal Kombat movie that we were kind of cold on. Oh yeah, and so Jean Claude Van Damme might be the Johnny Cage in that universe as like an aging Johnny Cage. Yeah. How because old is he now? <laughs> it, he's pretty old. I gotta say. So, yeah. uh, he was in that JVCD movie. That was actually pretty good. Did you ever see that? No, it was a long time ago, but, um, yeah, interesting stuff. I, I I'm also not super into Mortal, uh, Mortal Kombat as like a, or just like fighting games in general, but I don't know. Is it time to talk about Zelda? Well, let's just, we've mention- reached the 30 minute mark. Let's just quickly mention out this week, uh, this last week anyway, uh, Ease 9 Monster Knox got its PS5 release, which is very cool. I like that game and hope to return to it eventually. That was one I was playing on Stadia and then Stadia shut down and I have to start over now. Um, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to play any Honkai Star Rail, but that game is out. 
No, uh, you know, I watched some people play it. I didn't realize it was turn-based, which I'm kind yeah. of not into. It's like a turn-based version of Genshin Impact, but... Yeah, I don't know if I like that. Mm. And then the other game that's out is Humanity, which is that game that looks a little bit like those um, Clank levels from Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, where you go in and you have to, like, guide... It's like a puzzle to guide, like, a, a bunch of people to the end of the level, and you have to use, like, tools around the map to, to get them there. Hmm. Seems interesting, but I mean, everybody's playing Zelda, so <laughs> uh, I would maybe like to play that at some point. It is out, I believe, on PlayStation Plus or whatever one of those subscription tiers are if you're subscribed to that so you can check it out. But uh, let's get in to Tears of the Kingdom. So let's talk about how we got it. Um, I had a little bit of like analysis paralysis where I was like, I don't know where I want to pre-order this. There's so many different things I could get. And I ended up not pre-ordering it. Uh, And then I was just like, then like a a week before it was going to release, Target was like, hey, if you come pick it up at Target, you'll get a free fanny pack. (laughs) And I was like, okay, this is what I want. And so (laughs) thankfully, uh, my girlfriend was available to go there first thing on Friday. And she, there was not a lot of people there because it's somewhat of a rural Target. And she was maybe the fifth person in line. And they were like, hey, guys, we have uh, special editions or like collector's editions. If you guys want them, we have seven of them. Uh, And so in addition to the fanny pack, she also picked me up the collector's edition, which I was not expecting. A big surprise. Uh, Very happy about that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got that. And then I got off work at like 5 p.m. and uh dove in a little bit what was your experience i know you had to wait a little bit yeah it was frustrating so i was one of the people who jumped on pre-ordering the collector's edition really early so like i pre-ordered from gamestop which that's a big mistake obviously (laughs) uh and something i will not be doing again but they uh it was one of those fomo things where it's just like okay well yeah, that Wario 64 guy is tweeting, you can, the, the pre-orders for the collector's editions are up now. And I was like, well, if I don't get one now, I might not get one. Mm. And so I just went for it. And then like earlier in the week before it launched, they were like, they were sending out emails like, Hey, it shipped. And so I was like, Oh, this is going to work out just fine. And then, uh, like on Friday I was like, okay, am I going to get any updates on like when this is going to arrive? And in the email, GameStop evidently just says, hey, it's shipped, but they don't give you like any sort of tracking code. Mm -hmm. And so you have to like actually message their support and be like, hey, this is my order confirmation. Can I get some tracking information and hope somebody gets back to you, which they did. Um, And I found out that it was not going to arrive until Saturday. Hmm. And the game launched on Friday. As, and so that was frustrating because it's just like, well, what's the point of pre-ordering yeah. this thing if I'm going to get it a day after the release date? So that was annoying because like everyone, I was really excited to play it and everybody was talking about it. It's just like, I have to sit <laughs> on my hands for an extra day before I can play this. Yeah. Um, and then, but I did get it. They they also had this pre-order bonus and you could go into the store and pick it up, but they the stores were going to have these planks of wood. Yeah. And, of course, I had to work, so I couldn't just go in at, like, whatever the midnight sale was. And so I I was like, well, maybe, maybe they're holding them just for, like, pre-orders and they'll have enough for that. And they're not just, like, giving them out to whoever shows up to pick up the game. And so I went after work and they were like, nope, no, those are all gone. So (laughs) not only did I not get the pre-order bonus, I also had to wait an extra day to get it. So it was, I would say never pre-order anything from GameStop ever (laughs) is the the moral of the story. Not a great company, it seems like. No, uh, but I did get the, the collector's edition like you. It seems like you did it much better than me. Like not even pre-ordering, just getting lucky by totally by accident. <laughs> I, I initially was like, "Well, do I get the wood? Do I get the Walmart had like a, a wall hang that has the Master Sword, 
Best Buy had a poster you could get. And I really was just like, man, I don't know what to do. I don't want to make the wrong decision. And so my anxiety basically led me to not do anything. And then I saw that fanny pack thing and I was like, okay, this is, this is fine. This is a nice, like I can get this and it'll be good. Um, and then, yeah, they just happen to have the collector. They had like seven of the collector's editions. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I really like the metal poster that's in it. It's basically yeah. like, uh, like one of those, what are they called? I had never seen something uh, like that before where the way you mount it is it just comes with a magnet. Disc plate. Disc plate. Interesting. Yeah. You know, disc plate. They no. have a bunch of like gaming related uh, and like movie related posters that are, are basically this kind of thing where you, you basically have a magnet that like is sticky on one side. You stick it to the wall and then the, the poster is metal and it just like magnetizes to the thing you stuck to the wall. Um, I'm afraid to do it in my apartment, though, because I have the, <laughs> I'm pretty confident that that will damage the wall. So what I'm probably going to end up doing is just using command strips and putting yeah. the poster itself on the wall and just not using the magnetic part. But um, it's cool. It's I think it's cooler than getting a normal poster. Um, I have the I still have the poster from Breath of the Wild from when we went to the midnight yeah. launch of the too. Switch. Uh, so it's cool to have both of those posters now. Um, and I do like a steelbook case. I think the the steelbook case for this one isn't particularly like eye catching, but I guess it's cool to have. Um, and I did get the uh, the pro controller. The yes. Zelda theme pro controller, which has like the right handle is white. And it, then it has like some of those sort of um, glyphs gold like glyphs sort of the circular ones that are sort of accents on it uh it looks pretty cool and i've been using that and i've been impressed with the battery life as i always am with these pro controllers i don't know how they do it because like the in particular the dual sense controller has pretty poor battery life but oh the, really but the uh the pro controller lasts for days it's crazy my original one still does too. I picked my pro controller up the night I picked up my switch in Breath of the Wild with you, mm-hmm. and it's solid. I like very rarely have to charge it, and it lasts forever. Yeah, it lasts like days and days and days, even if you're playing a ton, uh, which I have been because I've been playing a lot of Tears of the Kingdom. But... How's the game, Zach? So I love it. I'm addicted <laughs> to it. I've been playing like crazy. Uh, oh, before we really dive into like what we're doing in the game right now, it's worth mentioning it did become the fastest selling Zelda title. It sold more than 10 million copies in the first three days. Wow. So crazy uh, cool mark to hit. Um, yeah, I love the new powers, like the new yeah. abilities. I love being able to like ascend through stuff, which I hear was like basically a tool the developers were using to get around the the location and they were like this is good enough that it should just be in the game (laughs) and not just be like a development tool or whatever and so they implemented it which i mean that alone uh along with the the fact that you can fuse basically any two items together i feel like that's what where the development time came in (laughs) Yeah, like the fusing yeah. is so good. Like, I finally found Hestu and was able to upgrade my um, inventory stuff. But prior to that, it was real. Like, I Breath of the Wild. Sometimes I did feel a little bit like, man, I don't have great weapons. I keep getting the same weapons over and over again. But the fact that there's so much variety, it feels like there's you know. 10 x 100 x times the number of weapons in this game than there was in uh breath of the wild yeah and a lot of that is because you can like uh, have a different strategy like maybe you want sort of a more of an axe type of a weapon that you can use to break boxes open easily and then maybe you need like a a weapon with a, a rock on the end of it so you can break those like breakable rock walls if you're like in a cave or something i love that that big spike ball that they in all the like trailers they showed it like rolling down towards you you know Mm -hmm. and so whenever there's a blood moon i'll go back to that uh skyview tower real quick 
and just go grab that and put that on the end of a stick. And then I have that all the time, basically, because it lasts forever. Really? Where is that at? That is at the, I think, the Hyrule Field one. It's like one of the first ones I... So, okay, let's talk about some trials and tribulations we've had. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right when you get off of the uh, the tutorial Sky Island, I thought that I was like, okay, I'm good to go now. I don't have my paraglider, but I'll figure that out. So I went to the first Skyview Tower I, I could see, which was that one, which is like the one where... I think the one from all the demos that they let the press play where it's like got a bunch of fencing around it and there's one of those big boss book hoplins and you have to like climb up onto a platform and then they bust open a, a wall and like drop that spike ball towards you and there's like a bunch of TNT around but um, I did that I beat the whole thing I was like great and then I went to the Skyview Tower and and I hadn't talked to Pura yet, so I couldn't do anything with it. I just like opened the door and I was like, now what? <laughs> uh, and then a blood moon happened and like the first blood moon happened and everyone reappeared. So I was like, man, this is awful. <laughs> uh, and then I like looked it up and I was like, okay, you have to like do a little bit more of the main quest. Um, but it is just like that, that I think it's like the Hyrule field sky, uh, sky view tower is that one. And it, yeah, it's, for sure, every time there's a blood moon, it'll reset and you'll get one of those nice big balls again. You can stick onto something. Yeah, I, it did feel like they withheld the paraglider for a bizarrely yeah. long time for some reason. I was It's like, so easy to miss. I, I feel like because I spent, you know, a good amount of time trying to get through that Skyview Tower, just kind of wandering around doing shrines. And yeah. I didn't even realize that I couldn't unlock the map yet because I hadn't talked to Pura. Yeah, they. I mean, I guess they try to lead you to it because it's like if you just keep following the main quest line, yeah. you'll get to it. But like, like you, when I got as soon as I got down to Hyrule, like the the main surface level map, I just all I wanted to do was explore and hit up those sky towers and shrines and stuff. I didn't want to do the main story at all. But like, you really have to like focus and keep doing that. Yeah. Just and just long enough to get the paraglider. Um, and then if you, once you do that and you do the first sky tower, you can talk to that Robbie who has like the mm -hmm. goggles and he'll be like, he'll sort of introduce you to sort of the underworld map, which is like the other reason why the game took so long to develop. Yeah. Cause there's basically an entire like lower level map that they made that runs most of the, uh, the map of like the main surface as well but underneath it and you go down there and he gives you the camera and the compendium uh which i feel like was a thing in the first one but i don't remember doing much of any of that and it was useful for tracking stuff because stuff you took a picture of in the compendium you could set your shrine tracker to track that oh yeah which was very useful that. can you still do that i don't know i haven't gotten the shrine tracker yet Oh, yeah, they're... Hmm. That's interesting. I'm going to have to look into that. But uh, I even before we got to the surface, my main, like, trial and tribulation of, like, the early part of the game was that third shrine. Because it's, for one, you're, you're up there on that sky island. You don't have the paraglider yet. And you go, you start going towards that third one and it's cold. And like, yeah. I, I should say they do a really, really good job that Sky Island as like a tutorial space of like showing you and teaching you everything because it's like, here's a fire, learn how to cook some like baked apples and stuff. And that's like the first thing. Then here's a cooking pot and cook meals. And so it kind of teaches you, okay, this is a cold space. We, you, you've got all these uh, spicy peppers that you can use to cook like a meal that will keep you warm for like three minutes plus or whatever. And then you use that. But like I was going up there and like the answer ends up being there's like some vines as soon as because you kind of go through this like cave lake thing and you come out and there's like immediately some vines that I think you're supposed to climb, which is how I eventually did it. But if you ignore the vines like I did the first time because I didn't think oh clearly I'm just supposed to climb this <laughs> you just walk past it because the path keeps going mm. and it leads you around 
and there's like nothing but like icy rock face so that you can't actually climb it Mm -hmm. and so i was like well how do i get up this and so i was looking off to the right and there's like a place that kind of goes down a little bit and i was like well maybe this leads up over there and so i made the mistake of going down there and of course once you do that you can't get back up yeah so you basically have to backtrack the entire way around again um which was annoying and frustrating um so that was my main trial and tribulation was even just getting to the third shrine but i almost soft locked the game in the the tutorial area really how i got to that part that was in the thing that Aonuma did where he was like, oh, there's a, a big lake. How should I cross it? And then they, they show you about fans or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I've seen this. I'm going to go crazy and build the craziest thing that I can. And so I used like every piece of wood and like the three fans that were laying around. And I made like a big catamaran. And I was like, this is going to be great. <laughs> and I hopped on and... It was it was going great, and then I like jumped just a little too early, and I got into the water, and then the boat went over me, and I was kind of trapped under the boat, and I couldn't do anything. I just had to wait until I ran out of stamina, and then I died, but then it put me on the original side of the river, and I had used all the materials, and they were all <laughs> on the other side of the river, so I was like, I don't know what to do, and... Thankfully, I was able to backtrack, and there was one of those big floating cubes that you can, like, mess around with. And so I just sort of had to, like, give that thing momentum and slowly glide across. It took, like, twice as long, but I was like, man, this is... It, what's frustrating also is there are a bunch of constructs hanging out, and they're like, we're building a boat. And you can they have an extra piece oh, of wood yeah. and, like, a fan. I was like, but okay, good, I can just take you these. Use it. <laughs> no, they're like, hey, we're doing this. You, you can't take our stuff. Uh, and I was like, man, I have messed this up. I wonder if I have to reload. But thankfully, I was able to use one of those big cubes and just like inch my way across. Because again, you don't have the paraglider. So you can't just like get really high and glide. You have to take a boat over. Well, and I assume that was also before you had unlocked uh, like the rewind ability. Yeah. Yeah, it was so, not great. Because that rewind ability is, is super useful too. Because you can like... If you need to get up someplace high, you literally like ultra hand something, you yeah. raise it up, and then you hold it there for like a couple seconds, and then you drop it, and then you just use rewind, and you climb on top of it. And so very you're... useful. Yeah, yeah, all the the um like abilities work really well together. Like have good yeah. synergies if you think about it. Yeah, and I saw I, I've been watching a lot of like clips uh, this last week while I was at work every now and then I, I will sneak over to Twitter and watch like some random little short videos of people doing goofy things and Tears of the Kingdom. And one of the fun ones I saw was uh, somebody had like taken like a, a tree that they had chopped down and they took the trunk of it and they like strapped it to or they uh, stuck it to a giant boulder and they just used ultra hand to like swing it around in circles and move it back and forth. Uh, and they were like near where a bunch of enemies were. And then they got like the enemy's attention. And as soon as they ran up to it, they just used uh, that rewind ability, which I forget <laughs> the name of. And it basically swung that thing around back and forth and just like took them all out <laughs> really quickly. It was I saw funny. a clip where a guy was just like the most overpowered thing in shrines is a bundle of sticks and he demonstrated this thing where you just like you you, because you can attach a a bundle of wood to an arrow and then just like shoot it at one like a sphere you have to collect that's like far away and then you can use ultra hand to attach to the sphere and then rewind time and the sphere will just come right to you wherever you are and he was like this makes a bunch of shrines very easy to do um Wait, explain that again? So you attach a bundle of sticks to uh, an arrow, shoot it at the sphere, it'll land and just become a bundle of sticks, and then you attach the bundle of sticks with Ultra Hand to the sphere, because you can do that from far away with Ultra Hand, and then you just uh, rewind, and it all comes back to you. So, well, why couldn't you pick up the sphere and just pull that back to you with Ultra Hand? Oh, I don't know. 
Maybe is that the, is uh is the sphere not grabbable with Ultra Hand? I don't know. Maybe yeah, it should be. Maybe I I don't know. I have to rewatch that clip again. But it was very impressive when I watched it. Hmm. Uh but speaking of fuse abilities, like you can now put like a cart on your shield and then use it like a skateboard because like shield surfing is still a thing that you can do uh in this game. Uh but you can basically skateboard and Have you, you done can, that, uh, the snowboarding shrine yet? I saw it and I failed it. <laughs> I, so I went up there and it was like, okay, it wants me to uh, basically skateboard off this platform, fall through the green circle. And then uh, I, I was like, wait, am I supposed to like use my paraglider here or will I land safely because I'm on a thing and so i died the first time because i didn't pull out my paraglider yeah uh, and then i tried I it a, a fairy, second thankfully. time i tried it a second time and i used my paraglider probably too much because i got down there and was too slow to make it through that second uh green circle and so i was just like whatever i'll come back to this later mm. uh, and i haven't done it since but yeah i, don't, I haven't done too much with the sky islands but the few ones i have done have been pretty fun uh just like figuring out what the puzzle is even yeah and then like once you work it out and you solve it it's like oh you feel like really smart <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the time it's like i don't know if that's how they wanted me to do it but i i made it work like there was this one uh that i did this morning where there's like a series of different platforms and they have those like movable platforms that you were just talking about using to like right. get across the the thing. And so I, I go over there and there's one of those like uh, monsters that is like a bundle of those like squares. You know oh, a I mean? construct? And, yeah, a construct. And so I beat the construct and he had this like green shard of some sort on his back. And so when I killed him, he dropped it and I interacted with it. And it like sort of a green laser pointer up to like where the shrine is mm. supposed to be. And it's like, mm-hmm. figure out how to get this up there. Yeah. And so I had to take, they like, they had a bunch of, of those uh, uh, Zonai rockets laying around. And so the answer was, I'm going to put a bunch of these <laughs> around the, that platform. I'm going to grab the crystal thing, put it on there. And so I, sh- I shot the platform way up and then I had to like, fortunately I had a few of those rockets as like the, those little pocketable, what are they called? Like the orbs? Yeah. The little gotcha Zona. things. Yeah. Yeah. I had a couple of those. And so I was able to s- attach those to the side because once I had gone up, I was like, okay, well what now? I was, and so I had to search my inventory and fortunately I did have a couple and so I had to just shoot that across the, the way and then take the crystal off. And uh, so that was cool because that basically is the shrine. You don't actually have to do a shrine after that. Like the shrine is figure out how to get this crystal to where the shrine's supposed to be. Um, and so you just go in and you have rewards there waiting for you, which is cool. But I did a couple. So I did one of those close to where Terrytown is. And uh, like I got the crystal and it pointed the laser pointer and then I had to take it across water. So I was like, I guess I'll make a boat. Uh, but I made like a really bad boat. And I like ran out of battery in the middle of this lake. <laughs> and then it kind of just upended and everything fell to the bottom of the lake. And I, I, I don't know what to do in that situation. Because like I can't ultra hand that laser anymore because I'm, I'm like swimming. So I just had to reload. And I guess there's probably a way to like reset the laser or the uh, yeah. the crystal. But... I didn't well, know what to do. You, if you have a battery, um, which I think you can get in those gotcha machines. Yeah, you can. Um, you just have to like have it on you. It's not necessarily laying around, I guess. But uh, how many hearts and like stamina upgrades have you done? I have seven hearts right now, and I need one more stamina upgrade to have two full wheels. Wow, of, two full of stamina. I I have. I believe nine hearts and one full circle of stamina. So oh, you have an upgrade of stamina at all? No, no, no. I have one full circle around the oh, base. Yeah, yeah. I have stamina. I have almost one full circle around as well. 
Oh, okay. I thought you had two no, like, no, no. Fulzer. I have the original one you get with nothing, and then the secondary one that you're building initially, I have almost completed. Okay. I So I have a full circle around the like base starting oh, stamina wow. circle, and then uh, nine hearts. So what... I, uh, have you done any of the dungeons yet, or have you steered clear of all those phenomena? I was going to, because I like we were texting a little bit, and uh, we both kind of started out in the middle, and I kind of moved around and like hit whatever shrines and sky towers were in the general vicinity of sort of the like center of the map where you start out basically, and then I eventually started moving northwest, and I made it up to Rito Village. And I believe I was like on track to to start that first dungeon, and then I was like, I don't want to do this yet. <laughs> I want to <laughs> explore more, and I want to like do more shrines and stuff. So I basically stopped progressing all of that and have just done like whatever side things had popped up, and I've just like been exploring and yeah. finding shrines and sky towers. And I've done a lot of. Um, if you do go up to the northwest, you find that gazette. Area. I need to do that, yeah. And there is uh there's a guy that that's basically Launchpad McQuack. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I ran into him at the the main hub town. He was like, "Come check me out." Yeah, yeah. So you you basically work with that guy if if you go around to the different stables, he's there hanging out and he's like I'm following leads on this weird thing that's happening around here. And you like help him out with different, like weird little side quests. Um, and that's building towards you getting all of the froggy armor. Ooh, where, where I think you're supposed to be able to climb even in the rain without like slipping. That's very cool. So th- that's a good armor set to get. Uh, do you have any cool armor sets? I've been using mostly, so I have the chest piece of the gloom armor, which has been very useful for me because I have been spending a lot of time in the depths. Man, where did um, you get that? That is actually, if you talk to when, where Robbie is in the hub town, his little pal Joshua uh, is like very interested in the deep, the deep dark or whatever it's called. There's a rock in that room. And they're just like, isn't this a cool rock? You can talk to that rock and it is like sentient and it will huh. sell you things. That's where you like turn in pose. Oh, I wondered about that. So he like, you do that and he's like, that's great. Um, initially he doesn't have a ton of stuff, but he's like, I have brethren in the deep, go find them and I can like level up or whatever. And he'll tell you where his brethren are for like some amount of pose. So I did that. I got the second one and then that unlocked the the first gloom armor piece. And so I got that and that has been very useful because I also just did the Deku tree. Have you done that yet? No. Stuff's not great right now in the uh, Korok forest. They're having a bad time. Um, (laughs) And so you have to sort of solve that problem for them. And it is easier to do if you have something that will suck up gloom damage. Um, so that was very is that is that what's happening to you when those hands grab you because those have been a complete nightmare for me i basically die every time i see them i have killed three of those um the it's like the gloom armor definitely helps because the second part of that it's hard to unless you have a spear if you have a spear you're pretty okay because you can kind of stay outside of the pool of it but if you just have a sword You really do need something that's going to soak up that gloom damage because as you're doing damage, you need to you're you're basically in the pool of gloom. So I think there's also like a a porridge you can drink. There's like a a porridge that you can craft that uh, restores you like like killed hearts or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know what the recipe is for that, though. but someone said there's a great recipe for like, oh, talk to this person and they'll give you like a recipe. I forget what the ingredients is, but I think I like got an ingredient that i like saw the description of and it was like oh cook this into a meal and it will like restore hearts uh even the ones that have been destroyed by gloom or whatever definitely those hands are the worst enemy i've run into so far especially because when you do the deku tree deku tree thing you do have to fight some of those hands but you have to do it in a very confined space so you can't just like run away or stand on top of something well, Which is so, not great. 
there's like a shrine like pretty early on that's like just off to the right of like the hub area that I like I kept forgetting that at, you have to like climb a vine to get to it. Mm-hmm. And like right at the base of that vine is like the gloom hands. Mm. And every, I I swear I went back to it like five times, always forgetting <laughs> that it was there because I, I like marked it. You know how you like use the mm-hmm. viewfinder basically and you zoom in and then you can set like a, a marker on it. I had done that and I was like, OK, I need more shrines. I need more uh, of those things so that i can upgrade health and stamina and all that and so i was just like going around i was like i need to go do that one it's like right there why haven't i done this yet and i kept going over to it i was like oh yeah it's gloom hands and i would die immediately (laughs) and run away again but um so yeah i need that i need to be able to take those out i i have only taken out one uh successfully and that was this morning because i was going uh up some mountain and it was like a snowy mountain and mm-hmm. there was like one that popped up as like i i can't have this right now like i need yeah. to be able to keep going and so i just like shot it with a bunch of bomb arrows and it eventually died <laughs> but uh it seems like shooting it with arrows is the way to go so you yeah bomb arrows is definitely them. those are where i because when you collect emerald not emeralds uh, rubies are like bomb arrows plus plus or whatever where they do like a big big explosion oh really so i i don't really use those unless i have to fight those hands and i'm very far away from them because that will get them down a lot quicker yeah i i looked up a a video at one point i was like how do you deal with these gloom hands because i i like they move faster than i can run away and of course i run out of stamina so they catch me and kill Mm. me anyway and so I was getting really frustrated by him. And I was like, well, how do you deal with this? And somebody was like, uh, you just have to shoot them in the eye to like kind of stun them and deal a lot of damage to them. But also you have to like, you want to freeze them with like freeze arrows or shock them with shock arrows. And that will stun them for a little while. So you I have also like- seen those dazzle berries are great for like uh, stunning them for a second. What do the dazzle berries do? Dazzle berries are like flashbangs uh, that you can blow off. Ah. Well, anyway, so I, I need to eventually go back and try to take out that thing. But now I think I will try to get that gloom armor. But the yeah, I, helmet for it is very, very cool. I haven't unlocked the helmet yet because I need to find another one of those rocks to talk to in the depth. Um, but I think when I've, I get the second one, it'll unlock. I have not spent very much time down in the depths at all. I've spent a lot so, of time down there. I need to. Oh, that's another uh, metric. I have a, a second full battery cell. Oh, really? How, so, how do you do that again? That is the forge constructs that you run into uh, who want you to buy those like uh, zonite, those like uh, the forge zonite charges. Zonite. Yeah, yeah. If you buy those, you get like, because you can just use zonite to buy them. Uh, and I think the ratio is like, it's like 30 Zonite for one of those or something. And then a hundred of those for one third of a battery cell. And so what I've been doing a lot is just like, it, it is very satisfying to go down into the gloom, like the mining mechanics where you just like pop it with a hammer and it like shatters and you collect all the Zonite is great and very satisfying. So I spent a lot of time just like wandering around the gloom finding some of those like veins where like gloomed bokoblins are mining killing all the bokoblins mining all the zonite and then you can initially pop back up to the tutorial island go back to that forge construct and say here's some more zonite but he only has like 10 at a time or something there's a forge down in the depths that i uh, stumbled upon that guy has way more you can buy at a time and then it takes I think like there's one like right near the hub area that guy is the guy you sell them to i think uh. and he gives you once you give him the like forged zonite he will say i need a 100 of these and then i can upgrade your thing but i would actually recommend there's a cool quest thing that happens if you go to the depths i think it's called like the the abandoned ancient mine or something um you get that great new forge and also some other stuff happens that's really really cool i have to do that the way to get there is actually you just you can you can use that uh hyrule field sky tower 
and then on the Great Plateau, there's a big hole where you can just like skydive into the depths. And from there, if you go down in the depths at that location, you should see like a huge structure off in the distance under there. And that's the big forge. You can go there and explore and find some cool stuff. But probably the best thing there is the uh, that extra forge guy because that makes collecting and like, for uh, what is it called? Uh, I guess forging Zonite way better, way quicker and more efficient. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do that because I again I basically I went down there because Robbie wanted me to go down there and he gave me the camera and the uh what you call it the compendium and then I like I unlocked a few of those like I think they're fast travel points down there. Yeah, um, those are great because once you unlock those, it gives you a wider area where you don't get gloom hearts when people attack you. Oh, so if you like go under them, does it like? Yeah, it uh, like heals all your gloom hearts. Okay, that's good to know. I basically just done that and really haven't really done anything else down it's, there. So there's a lot of cool stuff down there. Also, you'll see there's like different like podiums or rocks or things. Basically, something that's high up. You'll see like a, a ghost basically on top of that, and it's a, a ghost of like a soldier holding a sword or a spear or a shield that yeah, is not tarnished I saw at those. all. So are those like stronger or last longer? Yeah, they're so since they're no long, they're not tarnished at all or rusted. They're like fully good to go. They're like way stronger and they will last way longer too. That's good to know. But I'm yeah, I'm loving I, the depths. I have to say it's something I didn't even realize I want. It's basically my friend was talking to me about it, and he was like, they kind of just mashed up Breath of the Wild and Minecraft a little bit, which <laughs> is kind of true. It scratches that itch. Like when I'm going around hunting for Zonite, it feels great, and then I go turn it into that construct, and I get all those things, and I'm like upgrading my battery, and it's just like I don't even use my battery that much. I don't super. I still haven't really like. Uh, Use the Zonai devices all that much? Yeah, I don't really engage with that as much as I think other people do. I, I, I don't really enjoy the building as much. It's still fine, but I I much prefer to just, like, uh, have a horse or something. But uh, Speaking it's great. of horses, it was great. It was a nice little discovery to, like, go to one of the stables and yeah. realize that it, like, pulled all my horses from my Breath of the Wild save into cool. this game. It was very cool to, like, have those back again. I will say my main horse in Breath of the Wild was that big Ganon's horse, that big black one with the orange mane. Oh, really? I didn't find that one. I got that one out, and I was going to use it to transport a Korok, and the guy was like, oh, this horse is too big. We can't put a uh, a little, what are they called? The things that the horses drag? The bridle yeah, or whatever? Yeah, the attachment where you can basically, you have like a, you're pulling like a blank a, a yeah. plank of wood basically that you can attach to other stuff but he was like we can't put this on this horse it's too big and i was like oh <laughs> well, i guess i'm not going to use this horse so i just <laughs> i had a couple other horses that i saved um and i've been using that those yeah i have a handful of horses and like every time i take one out i always have that attachment on yeah. because you never know when you're going to run into one of those koroks that's like hey i got separated from my friend help me get back to them and that's, I think, I the best way to do a lot of those, because initially I was like, oh, I'll build it. Like, there's always pieces of wood around, and, like, I have wheels and whatnot. So I'll just, like, build something real quick. But that ends up being way more trouble than it's worth, and then you abandon yeah. it right afterwards. So it's so much easier just to have a horse and do that. Yeah, exactly. That's why I always do that, and then I just, like, literally just stick the the Korok guy on the, the piece of wood behind oh, the Oh, you horse. don't even put a cart on it? Yeah, I don't even make a cart. <laughs> I literally just stick him to that and pull him. Uh, people have been doing a lot of horrible things to Koroks uh, in videos on social media <laughs> and, like, roasting them and everything. I did wonder, like, what happens to them if, like, say you put them on something and you used a rocket to like shoot them somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, do they just stay there or do they eventually reset? I've got to imagine they reset maybe at like the blood moon or something. Cause I saw a couple clips where people were using like a, a wing, a Zonai wing to like get across a bunch of mountains. And then something happens and they like get dislodged from the wing and they just like fall down literally into a hole to the depths and they're just like, oh, no. And so, <laughs> I mean, you've got to imagine they reset so you can get those Korok seeds. But Yeah, because eventually know. they will get to a place where you cannot get them to where they yeah. need to go. I did another cool thing. I made it to Hateno Village because I oh, wanted I to. I just got there, I think. 
so if you do if you go to Hitano Beach, you'll find a message in a bottle, and that quest line is very fun because it. it I don't really engage with building vehicles, but the things that make me build a vehicle, I do end up having fun. And so they like, it's a situation where it makes you build a vehicle and all the pieces are laying around you. So you don't have to use any of yours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fun little quest line that you get to do uh, on Hateno Beach. So I recommend it. Yeah. I recommend I just... doing it at nighttime. Oh, really? Okay. I, yeah, I just got to a point where I started seeing a lot of those like, the building materials, but there's also like the, the wheels and mm. uh, like a steering wheel. Um, and one of the, the Koroks that I had to, to like get over to a certain place, like the only way to get him over there was to basically make a boat with like <laughs> a fan and one of those steering things. And so that was kind of the first time I used the steering thing. I was like, Oh, this is cool. Actually. I, I definitely need to to do more with that. And I also found a sky island that had one of those dispensers where you could get like a bunch of steering wheels out of it. So I, oh, I nice. now have like 10 of those ready to go whenever I need them, which I do need because there's like a, a side quest uh, geared around the, uh, the fairies and those big like flower yeah. puddles, you know? And one of the objectives there, you have to like, get their horse-drawn carriage thing. They don't have a horse, but you have to, like, figure out how to get it over this rocky path. Mm. And I think the game is leading you towards... You need to use this, like... There's, like, a, a big rock plank, basically, and, like, four of those wheels attached to it. And I think what it's wanting you to do is attach their carriage to that and then, like, steer it over that. So I'm going to have to... Now that I have some steering wheels, I'm going to have to go back and do that. But How many times have you helped out that sign guy? Oh, a bunch of times. A yeah, bunch that, of times for me as well. That's a fun little, like, like, short puzzle thing to do. Like, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, got to help this guy. I wonder what the ultimate reward is going to be. Because, I mean, he does give you good stuff in that he will give you items with recipes. So, like... Mm -hmm. I have a ton of recipes now, thanks to that guy. And also, like, money, which I'm always low on money because I'm always low on arrows, and I'm always trying to buy arrows. But um, I wonder if at the very end he gives you something really cool for that. I am worried, though, because I don't know how I would figure out which ones I'm missing. Like, I, I could see getting to a point where I've helped him out so many oh, times yeah. that there's still, like, one or two I don't know that I've done, and I have no <laughs> idea how I'm going to go back and find those. Yeah, for sure. Just like the Koroks, it's, there's going to come a time where I've done all but like a handful and I have no clue where to even start looking for them. <laughs> and if you look for a guide online, it's like, OK, now I have to revisit every single location yeah. to like check them off a list. And, Not great. Korok yeah. seeds, at least, will show up on your map if you've gotten them. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, they should like mar do some sort of marking to show that you've done that guy's sign thing but um what do you think of the combat i'm into it i like it i am not great at doing those hands has made yeah. me better at doing flurry rushes for the second part uh, See, where you have to do that, that. <laughs> i'm also bad at it but doing those hands has made me a little bit better at it um but i like it i i like like I will collect a bunch of crazy stuff, and then if one of my weapons runs out, I'll have, like, a stick and just be like, okay, well, I'll sort by fuse power and be like, oh, okay, I have this crazy black bokoblin horn I can just put onto a stick, and all of a sudden I've got another, like, 18-level weapon ready to go. Um, yeah, I And like I think the combat stuff. is pretty fun. I... I I've only been frustrated. Like I will fumble sometimes and like start holding down the wrong thing, uh, like the like five different wrong things in a row. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then die, the, but... the controls are kind of cumbersome. Um, like when that first weekend when it came out was Mother's Day weekend, and so I was hanging out with family, and I was trying to show my mom the game, and like she plays some games, but mostly like. 2d games that don't require the use of like two thumbsticks like yeah. one to control movement the other to control the camera and so when you're dealing with somebody that like that's sort of their skill level and you try to show them this game you realize pretty quickly 
how like when you have to explain to them how to shoot an arrow but like a fire arrow yeah because like i think that second like the second or third shrine of the game involves like firing a, a fire arrow to like hit some like leaves or whatever to drop a chest and so i'm like okay you have to hold the right trigger now press up on the d-pad but hold it in mm. now you now while holding both of those buttons use the right thumbstick to scroll across and find the right thing now let go of up on the d-pad but not the right trigger <laughs> and now aim with the right thumbstick that you're just using to like select a thing and then it's just like it's a lot of stuff and it's like very easy to like confuse all of that i will also say and i think this is this was true in Breath of the Wild, but it's even more true in Tears of the Kingdom. Um, they don't need to have a dedicated button for calling your horse because yeah. <laughs> that's never a thing that needs to happen. And the way that thro- they've implemented throwing stuff is overly complicated because you have to act like you're going to throw your weapon yeah. and then press up and then select what you want to just throw with your hand and then it switches. But they could have used the down D-pad to be like throwing stuff or something else more useful than calling your horse, which I feel like never happens. Yeah, calling your horse could just be tied to that radial menu that you use to select which power you want. Yeah. Just like sele- have a horse icon on that little radial menu and just like do it that way instead. But yeah, I don't know. The, the controls are... A little bit tough to get used to and li- like you said like if you want to swap uh, when i first started playing because it had been like since 2017 since i played yeah. breath of the wild like just trying to remember how to like switch your bow and arrow uh <laughs> yeah when you're like it, it thinks you have like a melee weapon equipped and so you're like well it said just hit right on the d-pad okay i'm trying that but it's just letting me select my mm melee weapon you're like no you have to draw your bow first and then it'll let you do it it's uh menus on top of menus and yeah like the same button combinations work differently depending on what <laughs> item you have equipped at the at that time so but if you do it enough it just starts to become second nature yeah like- you figure it out eventually it's just like it's rough at first I don't know, anything else you wanted to... to, uh, We'll obviously be talking more about it the more we play. Neither of us, I think, have done any dungeons, so I'm sure we'll go into that. I have not gotten the Master Sword yet, although now I think I know where it is, so I'm going to go check that out. I was going to say, I think I know where, or or I know how to get it. I'm just not sure where to go for it just yet. Yeah. Um, And yeah, we'll probably talk a lot more about it in the weeks to come, because we're going to be playing it. uh, I'm going to go ahead and... uh, update our game of the year top 10 builder oh, yeah. and I put to uh to do that tears of the kingdom it, at the top i i think that's a good place for it <laughs> i wonder if it will ever be d3 i guess we'll see when starfield comes out but uh yeah i was gonna say um uh, for me anyway i i'm pretty confident with it being number one and i do think it will be game of the year uh, yeah. by the end yeah, the hard question to beat. for me personally will be, how much do I like Starfield? Yeah, it's such a. Uh, well, I mean, it's going to be less than a month before uh, we're going to know a lot more about it. We'll have a big show when that comes out, talking about the Microsoft press conference as well as the deep dive on Starfield they're going to do right after. Yeah, but in the meantime, I'm very excited to get back to Zelda. I was playing it before, right up until we started recording, and now <laughs> it's like, it's time to stop recording so I can get back in there. And I agree. <laughs> so uh, until next time, why don't you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Starside Cafe, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>